Uh, first of all, welcome. Um, <clears throat> the first thing I'd like to say is we don't teach classes like this normally at CEU Business School. Uh, we, we, we don't have rows of, li of people standing, staring at me and giving me the, the creeps. Uh, no disrespect. Um, so this is really isn't a master class. It's probably going to turn out into more of a uh, horrible word lecture, which I don't like doing. Um, we've only got 45 minutes, so uh, a lot of the information on these slides, I'm not going to go into details. I'm just going to give you some broad brush ideas, because I'd actually like, if at all possible, to have questions, because I think that's probably a more interesting way of talking about, about this topic. Um, put your hand up if you've not been affected by the current economic crisis. <laughs> Okay, one of my colleagues just raised her hand there. I, I think we have been affected. Okay, we haven't, all right. Uh, so that's a nice way to start our discussion that basically almost everybody in this room has been impacted by this, this crisis. And of course, what I'd like to do this evening is um, say a few things about why this crisis started. Uh, some of us will be familiar with it, maybe not all of us. Then, what are the effects of the crisis? And I think we can split that into two separate kinds, primary and secondary effects. So, you know, if you're an Anglo-Saxon company, you're probably suffering from the primary effects. If you're a German or a French or a Spanish or a Russian company, you're probably suffering from the secondary effects, and I'll come back to that. And then I think the stuff that I'm currently working on is trying to s make some predictions about where we think this is going and given those predictions what we can do to survive and then hopefully prosper. Um, another quick question, how many of you have lived through an economic crisis such as this current one? <laughs> okay, is anyone from Bulgaria in this room? Anyone from Ukraine? Has anyone lived through a currency crisis when the, the value of your, your currency collapses? <laughs> Continuous uncertainty. Um, one of those secondary effects that I'm going to talk about are currency crises, and I think this is a particular issue facing uh, Central and East European countries. Before I do that, I just want to sort of give us some interesting quotes from leading economists uh, the OECD World Economic Outlook in June 2007 said, the current economic situation is in many ways better than what we have experienced in years. June 2007. Our central forecast remains quite benign. A soft landing in the United States. What's a soft landing? Anyone say to what a soft landing is? No guesses? It's when the economy slows down but not dramatically. So, you know, the growth rate drops down to the bottom of the cycle and then slowly rises again. A strong and sustained recovery in Europe. I think I missed that one. <laughs> a solid trajectory in Japan. Well, I can't see that. And buoyant activity in China and India. Well, maybe that's true. Uh, when I was in Shanghai in, in October of last year, some of the managers I was talking to there were telling me that they were worried that economic growth was going to fall from 11% to just 8%. Can I borrow some of that growth for a few weeks, please? Uh, in line with recent trends, sustained growth in OECD economies would be underpinned by strong job creation and falling unemployment. But just two months later, the crisis begins. August the 9th, 2007. BNP Paribas closes three funds with strong subprime exposure. And that word subprime suddenly became part of our everyday vocabulary. I can't, I'm, I'm sure the guys at the back, you should have brought your telescopes. Uh, what, what, what I'll point out in this slide here is the blue line that is falling precipitously is the Dow Jones Industrial Index. So my pension in June 2007 was looking really good. I don't look at it these days uh, <laughs> because I'm a bit worried about if I do that I might throw myself off a building. And you can see that really the problems start from about August 2007, and it just gets worse and worse and worse as we discover this process which is called deleveraging. Right? Now, which was, the, which was the first US investment bank to go out of business? 
Lehman Brothers, right? Does anyone know what the degree of leverage that Lehman had when they went out of business? They had 35 times their own capital borrowed. Right? A leverage of 35 to 1. Now, imagine going to a bank and asking for a mortgage where you borrow 35 times your income. Right? You'll probably get politely turned away. But that's what was happening to these large investment banks. And let's try and see why they got into this mess. Well, I think I've got, I've got five, you know, seven or eight reasons. The first, of course, was at the time of the growth of this kind of leveraging was dramatically falling interest rates. Now, it was Alan Greenspan who pretty much kicked this off, the former head of the uh, US Federal Reserve. By cutting interest rates continuously for a period of 26 months, it suddenly made the availability of debt much easier than it was in the past. And so many people that historically would not have qualified for that debt suddenly had access to that money. This is the so-called subprime mortgage. All right? It's people that you don't expect to pay the money back. Now, the, the current chief executive, and I say the current chief executive of Citigroup because you never know what's going to happen, right? The current uh, uh, ch uh, chief executive says, the, pr the first principle of banking is you lend money to people who don't need it. All right? So subprime, as a concept, is the exact opposite. We lend money to people who probably can't repay. All right? So that's, that's the first thing. Uh, secondly, um, in the United States in particular, US Congress passes a series of laws which makes it easier to lend. All right? And we see a rapid growth in what we call disintermediation. Disintermediation is when the person borrowing the money is not talking directly to the person who's lending the money. All right? So the person doesn't go to the bank, they go to a mortgage broker. The mortgage broker gives them the mortgage and gets a, uh, a commission from the bank for selling the product. Related to that, of course, are inadequate regulations. Uh, after the the Great Depression in the 1930s, US Congress passed a law called the Glass-Steagall Act, which deliberately separated wholesale banking, corporate investment banking, from retail banking. This was repealed under uh, the Clinton administration. So all of a sudden, the traditional boundaries between an investment bank and a retail bank blurred, and everybody was selling the same products. All right. Now, the difference between a retail bank and an investment bank is that a retail bank typically has lots of branches, a large number of clients with relatively small accounts, whereas an investment bank, of course, normally has smaller number of accounts with large amounts of money in each account. The Glass-Steagall Act begins to blur those kinds of differences. The fourth thing, which I will be the first to admit I'm not an expert on, but I've been trying to get my head around it, is the development of credit derivatives. So here's what happens. Mortgage broker issues a subprime mortgage issued through Bank of America. What happens is, of course, Bank of America doesn't hang on to that debt. They sell it on to an investment bank. And what an investment bank does is it takes a whole bunch of these debts and repackages them into several what we call tranches, triple A, triple B, triple C, and junk. Right? And they package it together and they call it a collateralized debt obligation. And it becomes by itself a financial product. And so they go around to investment funds, mutual funds, Norwegian local governments, Icelandic local governments and says, we've got this new fantastic product which will give you an incredibly high return on your money. And so, of course, you know, these local governments and these investment funds are like, great, can I have some more of it? And they start buying into this debt. Now, can you understand how much more complex that is compared to the traditional way of lending? Is we passed on the debt several levels along. And the people who are buying the debt don't really understand the implications of buying the debt because the credit rating agencies, Deloitte, not Deloitte, sorry, uh, Fitch, Standard & Poor's, They've said they're triple A. Right? So through financial wizardry, we got to that point. 
Of course, at the same time, something else happens. As the prices of housing are rising, people are building more houses. So, of course, it's natural that as the supply of housing rises, price rises cannot continue. So at the same time as we're issuing more of this collateralized debt, we're also beginning to increase the supply of housing, which is going to naturally bring the prices down. So in some senses, this crash was self-perpetuating. It was bound to occur because we were throwing more debt into the market at the same time as we were increasing the supply of housing. Other things that are going on. Uh, the Basel Concordat is changing. The traditional way of regulating banks was regulators regulated the banks. They set the rules and the banks followed. The new approach was we'll let the banks regulate themselves. It's a little bit like giving the keys to the prisoners in the jailhouse. All right? Because as, as managers in banks, we are under pressure to increase our profits. So we might take risks that we wouldn't necessarily take if we were regulated away from doing so. And this is what's happening right now in, after the collapse is this discussion about how should we regulate. Another thing, I'm not an accountant, but another problem we have is that in most standard accounting rules, uh, losses are cash losses. Right? So, as a, so as a company, you have to measure that directly on the balance sheet as a loss in cash terms. Whereas in fact, you could probably make a guess that, in fact, although it might be losing right now, over the lifetime of that security, it may end up paying off. All right? And last of all, uh, there's a conspiracy theory that, in fact, government statistics were deliberately revised to improve the performance of the U.S. economy. I mean, I, I don't have enough evidence of a, of a global conspiracy to do that. But what's the impact? Well, first of all, the stock markets have gone back to 1997 levels. So if you had started investing in 1997, you're back to where you started. Right? Investors have seen huge amounts of money lost. And what we've seen, I guess most importantly, is this freeze in the interbank credit markets. These are the markets where banks lend to each other. Right? So for example, for construction, there are a fraction of the banks now that are lending that were lending uh, a year ago. We're seeing increasing unemployment. Uh, we expect that US unemployment will reach 10% by the middle of this year, if not sooner. It's record high. Unemployment in the UK reached 2 million uh, this week. Um, and we've seen some significant bailouts. I don't know whether you read the news yesterday, but the US Treasury announced that they're going to buy $1.2 trillion worth of debt. How does the central bank buy $1.2 trillion of debt? How do they pay for it? Any guesses? They print money. Right? It's a little bit like you with your credit card payment going into the bank and saying, do you take Akbar dollars? Because I've just printed some off of my HP. You take them. So what we're seeing now is a massive monetary expansion. Yeah. And of course, that may have long term implications for inflation in the US, which is why we've seen in the last couple of days, US dollar has been weakening quite significantly because investors are worried about the inflationary impacts. And of course, what we're seeing on a secondary level is a decline in business globally. Uh, the world's greatest car company, Toyota, made a loss for the first time in 74 years this year. That gives, you a, that gives you an idea of the depth of this crisis. I mean, we expect GM and Ford to make losses because they are permanently failing organizations. But when Toyota starts making that kind of a loss, we know we're in big trouble. So what's going to happen next? Uh, I'm going to present you four scenarios, which, are my, uh, which, which at the moment are my current best guesses. I might get up tomorrow morning and do this and change my mind. Uh, but as, as is often paraphrased, you ask an economist his opinion, you'll get at least two and a half or three back. Right. So what's our best case scenario? The next six months are going to be really, really tough. So we can forget about 2009. But by 2010, things are going to get better. And why? 
because what's happening in the financial markets are not going to impact the real economy in the long term. All right? So these toxic assets will not bleed into the real economy. All right? What we're going to see is because there are so many people losing their jobs currently that this growth in the labor supply and the fall in the price of oil. Now, I guess, you know, if you're OPEC or Russia, you have to start worrying. But if you're a net consumer of oil, it means inflation is not going to be a problem either. Excess labor supply, cheaper commodities. And these various stimulus packages that we've seen are going to work. So that's the good news. Look forward to 2010. Things are going to be just OK. You can leave now if you want, because it gets worse from here. <laughs> so here's the worst case scenario. I, I, I go from be, you know, best to worst. Um, we're going to have two to three years of severe uncertainty. And this uncertainty is going to change the psychology of the marketplace. And people are going to suddenly stop spending. This is what we call the liquidity trap. Right? We experienced the same thing during the Great Depression of the 1930s. Uh, the Japanese had a similar effect, the so-called L-curve effect. The economy drops and then just keeps bumping along the floor without break, returning to its previous growth cycle. Right? And these financial markets continue to spiral downwards, creating a huge wealth effect. Right? Now, in 2008, uh, sorry, end of 2007, uh, US saving ratios became negative for the first time in history. Right? And since most Americans hold most of their wealth in the stock market rather than in fixed income, as we do in Europe and in Asia, as this stock market keeps going down, Americans keep getting poorer and poorer and poorer, right? because the value of their assets continue to decline. This means that aggregate demand, economy-wide demand, collapses, and government stimulus money is not enough. This is what Paul Krugman in the New York Times, the Nobel Prize economist, is talking about. And he's saying that, look, there's just not enough money being put up to, to bail out the economy. As a consequence, we all decide to protect our shrinking market. So the Americans raise trade barriers, the Europeans raise trade barriers, uh, the Asians raise trade barriers, and all of a sudden world trade declines. And then several small countries in Central and Eastern Europe go out of business. Latvia. It starts with Latvia, which is probably the weakest link then Hungary, then Ukraine, not that small East Central East European country. And slowly but surely, we see a complete collapse in the world economy. Sorry. That's my worst case scenario, OK? It gets better from here. I've got, I've got two intermediate scenarios. Uh, the first one is, till about 2009, uh, most of this year we have uncertainty. And then we have stagnation in the EU and the US. All right. Stagnation is when you have low growth and rising unemployment. Yeah. So your growth of you know, half of 1% for an extended period of time. And, these, and the credit crunch that I refer to pushes many Western companies to bankruptcy. So General Motors go out of business. Siemens goes out of business. Uh, several large industrial conglomerates that we take for granted. General Electric, by the way, General Electric's uh, credit rating fell from AAA for the first time in 56 years. All right, just an illustration of what we're, we're talking about. And the real winners from this are Asian countries. Right? Because the centralized economic model practiced in Asia, particularly in China, comes through because it's strong government centralization which keeps their economies from collapsing. All right? So what we see in this scenario is a shift of power from the Western Hemisphere to the Eastern Hemisphere. So the cards on the global economic deck are reshuffled. And so in the future, we look to China for global economic leadership rather than the United States. Start learning Mandarin Chinese. Uh, the second intermediate scenario is we have two to three years of stagnation and growth starts again in 2012. The same wealth effect that I mentioned before, but the difference in this scenario is, is that America and Europe get it right. They go on these new green technologies. And it's these new green technologies which leads to the next boom in the economic cycle. All right? So if the previous boom were these uh, mortgage-backed securities, and the previous one was the dot-com boom, the next one is the green 
technology boom. All right? And we all benefit because not just the leading companies in Europe and North America develop these technologies, but Asian economies benefit because they become suppliers to these green technology companies. So here, here are those four scenarios. Anyone got a question at this stage? No questions? Yep. How would a slowing US or North American economy would affect China and all the Asian countries? Well, China's big problem is that much of its growth is driven by exports, right? And its two core export markets are the EU and, North, and the United States. So, of course, if, if the EU and US economies slow down, Chinese companies have got to get growth from somewhere. <clears throat> but in this, in this previous scenario, what happens is that the Chinese government steps in and creates demand in a significant way through public works projects, significant re uh, reinvestment in infrastructure, and so forth. Don't forget that the, uh, the Chinese government has placed Chinese companies in a very strong place right now. They're the single biggest investors in Africa. Right? They're buying up huge amounts of natural resources, building infrastructure for African nations, and in the long term, building a new market for their products. So, that, so I think that scenario really says that's where China emerges as a strong player. The second scenario says, well, once again, the Americans and to a certain extent the West Europeans get it right on technology. They bet on the green technologies and those are the things that emerge uh, as dominant. Um, Tom Friedman, have you heard of, heard of Tom Friedman? He's, uh, he, he wrote that terrible book, The World is, Fl the, uh, the World is Flat. Absolutely dreadful book, but anyway, whatever. He's an interesting guy. He was interviewed the other week on TV, and he said, you know, the difference between this economic collapse and previous economic collapses are, in the previous ones, we were left with something behind. Right? So after the Great Depression, we had all of this infrastructure, railroads, buildings, and so forth. So we had something left. After the internet...